Okay, it's recording now. So let's begin. So the first question I want to tackle is actually question number two. So this is the indices law question, which is right here. Determine which of the following is greater. Justify your answer with clear calculations. This question was pretty badly done uh, for my students. The average for this score was one. Or actually zero, to be very honest. So a lot of students made a lot of mistakes here or didn't know how to proceed for such a question. So the tip for this kind of comparison of very huge numbers is to always make the powers the same. So I'm going to write it down for everyone. Make the powers the same. So if you have never encountered such a question like this before, our objective is to always make the powers the same. Then we compare the bases of the, of the terms that are appearing. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, there are many ways of doing it. So one thing I can see straight away is that this is 200 and this is 400. Using indices law, I can break down the 400 into 2 times 200. And this will become 3 squared of 200. And this will simplify to 9 to the power of 200. Once we can do it this way, then we can actually compare the bases of both numbers. So I'm going to take the 9 and I'm going to take the 8. So by comparing the bases, now this makes it very obvious that 3 to the power of 400 is actually a lot bigger than 8 to the power of 200. And therefore, the answer is actually this. So do take note that you do need to write a justification statement. You do need to explain that the base of 9 to the power of 200 is actually bigger than the base of 8 to the power of 200. And therefore, 3 to the power of 400 is actually greater. It's very important to explain because the question did say you need to justify in your answer. So this is the first question that I want to talk about. So the important tip is to always make the powers the same. Is the tip. Next, I'm going to move on to question number six. So this is question six, the milk jug question. This is a really common kind of question in exam where students will be asked to actually plot a graph with reference to something. So there are two scenarios where you can plot graphs in exam. Number one is about pouring water into a container. And then they will ask you to plot a red time graph. That's number one. And number two is most likely changing between distance time graph to speed time graph or speed time graph to distance time graph. Or maybe sometimes for more uh, difficult questions will be acceleration time graphs. For this case, I'm testing the concepts of rate and speed. And I want to see whether students are able to plot the graph when you're pouring liquid into a container. So that is part B. But first, of, first and foremost, let's talk about part A. So the question is asking you to figure out what is the time needed to fill up the fulstrum. In case you don't know, this fulstrum here, this is actually this part of the container. And how do we book this up? A lot of students didn't manage to get this question correct or anyhow do the question. When in actual fact, this is a pretty simple question. How do we do this? So there's a very important keyword in the question. And this keyword is something that you should always spot whenever you are doing questions of this nature. The word is similar. Cylinder. So the word similar down there should link it to, should tell you that this is a congruency similarity question. And you're going to use your volume formula. So please remember one important concept, time. It's always related to your volume formula. So we can use the L1 over L2 cube formula with reference to time as well. So how do you work this question out? L1, which is 1 over 2. Why is it 1 over 2? Because the question says that the radius of the big cylinder is 2 times of the smaller cylinder. Cube is equal to T over 12, where we take T to be the small cylinder. Take note that you're only allowed to compare similar shapes. You're not allowed to compare straight away with the big cylinder with the fulstrum. That's what a lot of people did, which is wrong. 
you need to compare actually this big cylinder and the small cylinder. We always compare similar shapes, never ever shapes that are of different size or different nature. So we solve for this, we'll get T is equals to one and a half. And from here, we know that 12 seconds is for the big, 1.5 is for the small. We can take the whole question, which is 17 minus 12 minus 1.5, answer is three and a half. So uh, time will be 17 minus 1.5 minus 12, answer is 3.5 seconds. Oops, sorry for the bad handwriting. This is part A. So this one was badly done. So just hope that everyone could understand, can understand how to do these kind of questions. We're going to sketch the depth time graph, okay, or the rate time graph, or what is happening to the height of the liquid when it's being poured into this container. Now, for this kind of questions, there are a few ways that you can actually study for them. One is actually to memorize the different types of graph, and then you'll be able to plot all different types of graph. Or number two, if you don't want to go under the memorization route, you can actually understand the concept behind this. It's a very simple concept, so let me explain. So for cylinders, how do we usually look at cylinders? Now, cylinders have a common height. So imagine you're pouring a liquid into this container, and in this container here has the same height throughout. What will happen to the rate of the height increase inside this container? As the height is constant, when the water is being poured in, and also assuming that the liquid being poured in is constant, the rise of the height will always be the same. So for cylinders, it is always a straight line graph with an increasing gradient. So the graph should actually look like this. Since we know that it is 12 seconds, so we're going to go from 0 to 12. Okay, this is the answer. So I'm going to draw a straight line. And next, we're going to talk about the full strum. Now for the full strum, right, if you cannot imagine what kind of diagram this is, think of it like an inverted cup. Okay, so I have a cup actually here. So this is my Starbucks tumbler. It's about this shape, but upside down. I, I cannot flip it now because my I have water in my tumbler. So imagine you have a container of this nature. Now let's think about pouring water into my this cup here. What's going to happen to the rate of flow compared to the base to the top? Now, the base has such a small radius compared to the top. So therefore, the base should actually fill up a lot faster as compared to the top for my, for my cup here. For your full strength, this is an inverted situation. So therefore, the top will actually fill a lot faster than the bottom. So what I'm trying to say here is that this piece down here, we've compared to this piece down here, okay? This piece here, the rate is a lot slower. And we can see that as you slowly, gradually move up the container, okay, the, the, the sides are actually getting smaller and smaller. This means that the rate of flow into this container is going to get faster and faster because you have a smaller area to fill up. Huh? Once this is done, okay, we know that now, Okay, the water going in will get faster and faster. Okay, the, the, the increase will get faster and faster. Therefore, this is an increasing gradient. Okay, it's a curve going upwards. And it should be about 3.5 seconds. So it's about like this. The last one is actually a cylinder again. So it's another straight line going all the way up to 17. So from 3.5, go to 17. So the way I mark this question, it is three marks for each individual section of the graph. As long as you show me a straight line and the curve, don't I don't really care the value for now. So if you mess up your part A and you manage to actually give me the correct graph, I'll give you the marks for error carry forward. But this should be the ideal situation. Now take note that this is a trick question as well. The graph goes all the way to 18 where the question only stops at 17. So please be very careful when you're reading your questions. Do not exceed past the axis given to you. And this is this milk jug question. Next, we're going to talk about question seven. I hope, I hope this is clear on my explanation. Question seven. Now, this was a very, very badly done question. 
for my students. So if for context of how many people took my paper, it's about 30, 30 to about 35 students took my this paper. And I, I have a rough estimate of the, the questions that a lot of people didn't do well. This is one of them. So that's my objective today is to actually go through these more challenging questions. For this one down here, this is actually not as difficult as it seems. A lot of people had a lot of issues with this and there's a very very grave mistake that a lot of students make. So this is a cylindrical sausage and you have a pipe that looks in this shape. Now we're going to chop off two sections of this pipe and your job is to figure out what is the volume of the remaining pipe. A lot of students, when they do this question, they didn't know how to start. So during my mock paper, I actually gave a hint and the hint was to actually split up this cylinder into multiple sections. So I'm going to use my red pen and I'm going to chop it up into this kind of sections. So one and two. So once you chop up your cylinder into these amount of sections, then you'll be very clear that, okay, my objective now is to figure out each individual section and its respective volume. So I'm going to label A, B, C. The easiest one you can actually find is B. So for B, this is a cylinder. So you just need to compute the volume of a cylinder, which is pi r square h, and you will get your answer. So let's do that first. So this is for B, uh, section B. So this is volume, okay, pi radius square. We all know that the radius is one. And the height of this container, is three. So total is three pi. So as long as students give me this, I will actually give it to you. So I'm pretty lenient about this question and it's, it was pretty badly done. Now let's talk about A. So a lot of people, and trust me when, if you're looking at this question for the very first time, I believe you have this inclination in your head that this is a cone. Is this true? No. This section down here, please take note that it is not a cone. What's the condition of a cone? If you want to calculate the volume of a cone, it shouldn't look like this. There are actually, uh, there's a formula for this, but it's not in the O-level syllabus. The correct way to actually work this section out is to realize that the parts that you've chopped off from this cylindrical sausage is actually the same as section A. They're just mirror images of each other because you're just chopping something in half mark. If you don't believe me, next time when you go and eat like a sausage from, from outside or whatsoever, you chop it in this way and you'll realize that your two halves are actually going to be the same. So the way to do it is just taking the volume of the cylinder and dividing by two. So that is section A. So part A, okay, the volume, okay, is half of pi one square three. Answer is three over two pi. So this is the section A. And now we're going to talk about this. So there were students that actually thought that this was a cone. And it's a bit, uh, it's obviously wrong. This is impossible for this to be a cone. And how do you work this out? So if you realize, I can actually chop this figure into two. So I'll move this red mark and move this C first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop this into half again, like this, lengthwise. So sorry for the crooked line, like this. And then what do you realize? If you look at this section down here, it actually can be chopped in half like this. So the other part that is shaded can be chopped up like this again. Ah, and now you have four different sections that are equal, okay? So therefore this is just three quarters of actually this portion of the cylinder. So let's see. So I'll work it out. So for part C, oops, sorry for that. So volume is three over four pi one square times four, three pi. And therefore we have reached the final answer. You just need to take these three numerical values down here and add them up. And the final answer is seven and a half pi. So final answer is seven and a half Hi, CMQ.
Uh, someone asked me if this session will be uploaded to YouTube. Yes, the answer is yes, it will. But I do not know when. It's up to the person that is posting this question. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question. So the next question I want to tackle will be question 10. But before that, I actually want to make a comment about one of the other questions, So which is question 8. So if you didn't know, this whole entire paper is made out of different school prelim questions that I've uh, collected over the years. And I've modified some of the questions to make it either harder or simpler. This is one of them that is actually taken from an external source. If you haven't recognized the question yet, this is actually the PSLE question from 2021. Last year's difficult question for 2021. Now, a lot of people will be asking me like, why? Why, why did I put this in? Okay, it's a very simple reason. It's because when I read this question for the very first time, or I think when a lot of people read this question for the very first time, especially for SEC4 or further students, a lot of people will be, eh? <laughs> you read the question and you will also start because it's not that simple. So that's why this question is inside, just to see whether students are good or not. I'll be very honest with the statistics of my paper. Uh, this question was pretty badly done. The average was actually about 0 0.6. So that means most people got actually zero for this whole question, as a lot of people couldn't do. So I'm not going to go through this. Okay, the answers is already out there. So you can go and review this question on your own. This is actually last year's PSLE 2021, one of the most difficult questions in that year. So we scroll down, we're going to move to question number, did I say 10? Ah, oh, okay, 10. So for this question here, I actually don't really want to uh, go through this, okay? Even though I mentioned that I wanted to go through, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about this. So this question here, the a lot of people actually could do, my, my students could do it, but I just wanted to make a little note for those that are actually trying the paper on your own. This question is actually not... Uh, as difficult as it seems, a lot of people have actually a lot of problems proving part C and part D. This is actually one of the ways to prove Pythagoras' theorem. And the beginning part is actually not difficult. The question is asking you to figure out why BPA is a straight line. This is moving to circle properties. So I'll just run through the question very quickly. I won't write anything down as I don't want to spend too much time on this question. So the first thing is that AC is the diameter of this circle. So I'm gonna draw a line across. This is the diameter. And also BC is the diameter of this circle as well. So you need to think back to angle properties and when have you seen a diameter? So if I were to draw a line down from C to P, just like this, we have formed some interesting things. So ABC or APC, sorry, it's actually a right angle triangle. And the reason is because angles in a semicircle. So this is 90. The same thing for CP, uh, CPB. This is also another right triangle in a se uh, semicircle. So this is 90 as well. And therefore, we have actually two right triangles side by side. And therefore, angle BPA is 90 deg uh, 180 degrees. Therefore, BPA is a straight line. This is the proof. A lot of students lost marks because they either never write reason or they anyhow proved a straight line. So just saying that it looks like a straight line doesn't work in mathematics. You do need to actually prove it out and write a complete um, foolproof statement. Just to guide students for part C and part D, in case you have issues doing it, this is actually playing with your corresponding ratios of similar triangle concept. So to find a square equals to xc and b square equals to yc, you do need to show these two parts. It's from here, the similar triangles. <coughs> you need to pair up the similar triangles and then write the corresponding ratios and then cross multiply. This is how you work out this question. This question is not difficult. Just wanted to make some notes about it. Next will be question 12. So we're going into the territory of slightly more challenging questions. So question 12 is one of them that is on the more difficult scale, 12. Okay, this one I will go through. Now, in actual fact, when I set this question for, the, for, the, for my students, I didn't expect it to be that badly done. I, I know that it will turn some hits definitely, but I didn't expect it to be this badly done. The statistics for my this question is, 
average is two marks. Oh, no, no, average is one mark, sorry. So, out of three. A lot of people got the one mark because of the very easy one that you can spot. The other two are slightly more challenging. How do you do this question? Your job is to actually work out what is the very last digit of the following sum. A lot of people go and actually try to type this whole number into the calculator. And obviously, by, need, by design of the question, you won't be allowed to because you are going to get a standard form on your calculator. So it's impossible. So how do you work out this question? This is actually a number pattern question, if you haven't realized yet. What do you need to notice? So we're going to do the very easy one first. Then we'll go to the more challenging one. So we'll start with the 5 to the power of n. Notice that for the 5 to the power of n, every single last number is ending with 5. So 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. This should tell you that as you recur down throughout the whole sum, your last digit will always be 5 for any 5 to the power of n. So this number down here is 5. There is one mark that most people got. Next one will be 4 to the power of n. This one is also pretty easy to spot. The, the harder one is 7 to the power of n. So for this one, if you notice any numbers that are of the even powers, n with 6, any numbers that end with an odd power is actually ending with a 4. So this 30, your power 30 down here, this is actually an even number. And therefore, this number down here should be 6. That's all. The most difficult one is 7 to the power of n because this one doesn't really have a very obvious pattern. So what you should actually do if you are actually doing this question on your own is you do need to continue solving down what is 7 to the power of 6, 7, 8, 9. Just do a little bit more to find a pattern. So a lot of people, right, when they see number pattern questions, they get very stuck or very scared because they cannot don't know how to start. Suggestion is to always try to work out like a few more and try to see the overall pattern that is going on. If you were to work it out, you will realize that the last digit pattern is always going in this recurring uh, order, 7931. Then you will loop back to 7931, 7931, all the way down and down and down. And this is the pattern that we are interested in. The clue for this question should have been this number is 7 and this number is 7. So it should kind of ring in your head that, oh, okay, I'm actually jumping back to the start. So how do we identify what is the number for 84? So you just need to check where will 84 left list uh, inside this whole table down here. So this will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So looking at my numbers down here, you don't need to go all the way to 84. Just realize that 84 is a multiple of 4, and therefore, it follows the 1 range. And this is 1. So therefore, you can just sum all your numbers up. You will get your final answer. Answer is 2. 6 plus 1 minus 5, answer is 2. And this is how you do this question. Next, I'm going to talk about question 13. And the one that I'm interested in is actually part C. I'm not going to do the whole question as part A and part B are relatively standard uh, questions. It's the part C that's a little bit on the challenging side. So let's go through that. For part C, the question is asking you to figure out what is the area of this whole entire figure here. A lot of prelim questions right now, especially in the 2020 region to 2021, a lot of schools like to test students on calculating the area of a polygon. And you should be able to do it because it's not that difficult. The way to do this kind of questions is to actually chop up your regular figures or your regular polygons into multiple triangles. We're going to split, I'm going to split this into two sections. I'm going to calculate the pentagon first, and then I'm going to calculate the, oh, sorry, I'm going to calculate the hexagon first, then the pentagon. For the hexagon, <clears throat> this is how I'm going to chop it. I'm going to go from F to I, H to E, and G to E. So if you haven't already known this fact, for hexagons, hexagons are very special figures because 
especially if they're regular. This is the, the reason is very simple because whenever you have a hexagon that looks like this, a few things already automatically happen. All the lines in the center down there will all be equal length. So this means that everything down here will be of equal length. And another very unique thing about a hexagon is that you, when you take 360 degrees, which is the angle about a point, and divide it by six, you will get 60 degrees. So we all can establish that the triangles in there are first and foremost isosceles, but since they are isosceles, right, and the interior angle down there is 60, it should be pretty clear that the remaining two angles will also be 60, and therefore there are equilateral triangles inside hexagons. So this is a very important property about hexagon. Hexagon contains equilateral triangles when you chop your hexagon up into different sections. And take note that this only works for regular hexagons. For pentagons, octagons, nonagons, ah, these are not going to be uh, equilateral triangles. These will actually be isosceles triangles. So just take note of this. So we know that the side length of this particular line here is eight. So I can label this as eight and eight. So I can find the area of one of these triangles using trigo formula, half AB sine C, and then you just multiply by six and you will get the area of the hexagon. So I'm gonna start off the calculation now. So the hexagon area is six copies of half A, B, sine C. Excuse me. I'm not going to work this out because I, I, for me, my style is to always leave things in exact form so that I will never ever have any rounding errors. So I'll leave it as such. So yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if you're my student, you will realize that I, I love to do this. I'll call this happy face. Okay, then I will work it out later. Now we're going to the pentagon. Uh, pentagon is slightly tougher. A lot of people couldn't find the pentagon. The way to do it is the same thing, is to chop it out just like how I'm chopping my hexagon. But unfortunately here, you got no corners to actually like link up because it's not possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine a center like this. And we're going to draw out to all five corners. So one, two, sorry, let's start. Three, oh, sorry. Okay, imagine that it's straight out. Sorry for the bad drawing. Now, when we calculate it this way, now this is going to be a lot simpler. So number one, first step you can do is to work out what is the interior angle down there. And this angle down there will be 72. How do I get 72? 360 divided by five. So I've established already that all polygons, when you chop it up like this format here, you will form isosceles triangles. So all these are isosceles. But take note, these are not equal to eight because this is an isosceles triangle. So do be a bit careful. Huh? These are different lengths for the eights down there on the pentagon side. How do you work out what is the area? So this is actually a trigger question. Uh, you do need to spot the trigger thing that you need to do here. What you can do is actually to draw a angle bisector from the center down to ED like this. So let me draw this out properly. When I draw something like this, take note that this is an angle bisector and at the same time a perpendicular bisector as well. And therefore this will chop the line exactly in half. So this is four. By trigger laws, we can actually work out what is the size of this triangle, or you can actually work out what is the height of the triangle. For me now, I'm going to find the height because it's a lot simpler. So by Tokaso, this is a 19 degree triangle. I'm going to use tangent and it's going to be half of 72, 36. So tangent 36. So I'm going to move to the pentagon now. So pentagon area. Okay. So, okay, before completing the area, let's find the height first. So height. 
So it will be tangent of 36 degrees. Okay, this will be equals to 4 over h. We know that h is equals to 4 over tangent 36. And this is the height of my triangle. And right now, we have all of the lengths of the triangle. We have the height of the triangle. We can just multiply by 5 to work out each individual triangle. So area will be 5 copies of half times 8 times the height, 4 over tangent 36. Put this up. Okay. Uh, same thing, I'm not going to calculate. See, so my style is to draw another happy face with a tongue, like this. Okay, pretty cute. Uh, what you need to do now is just to sum up the happy face and the happy face with the tongue. So total is equals to happy face, oops, sorry. Plus happy face with the tongue. And the final answer is just 276 cm square, I think. Is it in cm? Uh, yeah, cm square. So take note that this uh, happy face thing, uh, please do not do this in exam. Please actually work it out because you do need to get the numerical value. Unless you're going for exact forms, then you can actually leave your answer in this way. They will give it to you for your method mark. And then at the very end, just tabulate the whole thing. Next question I want to tackle will be question number 19. So two more questions for paper one, they will move to paper two. So question 19 is actually the toughest question in this whole entire paper. Question 19 is pretty difficult. So if a lot of people couldn't do, uh, I, was, I, was pretty ex I was expecting a lot of people not to be able to do 19. So uh, it hit my expectations. But in actual fact, it's not the most difficult thing in the world. It's just a bit obscure. So first thing, you should realize that this particular question here, what topic are you under? So if you are a student right now and you are having trouble with math, a little suggestion to you, if let's say you do not have enough time to actually complete prelim papers or what now for your prelims that are upcoming, a little advice for students is to actually go into questions and go and identify which topics are they from. Why is this important? Because all papers are going to be jumbled all over the place. And your job in the exam is to go in there and fish for the information in your head. And a lot of people will have this problem of actually fishing for the information. So a technique that I teach students is to go and look at the question and go and ask yourself, what topic am I from? If you know what topic you're from and you know the different steps that you need to take, you don't actually need to work out the question because the rest are just mechanical working. It's all about identifying what concept you need to use and what chapter you are in. So if you're in like crunch time, you don't have enough time to complete papers, this is something that you can do. So by looking at this question here, what will be the topic that you will need? A lot of people will say that this is either congruency similarity or this is properties of circle. Uh, fun fact, no, this is not true. This is actually a trivial question. So it's trivial. It's just not obvious. So I'm going to show you where the trigger aspect comes in. This whole entire figure is just a bit, a bit a much right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to chop this figure up into three different sections. And I'm going to look at one of them. So the section I'm interested in is OY, this triangle here. This question is pretty popular. It's pretty popular last time. Uh, it's a pretty old question as well. So I think it's from my young girl's high school, if I remember correctly. So I'm going to isolate this triangle here, OC1Y, and I'm going to draw it at the bottom here so that it looks uh, a bit easier to manipulate. So something like this, pardon the bad drawing. So I'm going to write down the length, OC1Y, P, C2. And these are all the values. So this is A, this is B, and now we're going to work out what is the ratio between A to B. If you realize this whole entire question here has no numerical values at all, the only thing you're left with is just A and B. So unfortunately, you need to pull numbers out of thin air. Lah. And there's a way to do it. Now, this line OY, there's a very special name for this line. 
I'm just going to review it now, but what is the name of this very special line? This is actually an angle bisector. If you know your angle bisector and perpendicular bisector properties very well, you should be able to see that this is a very special circle. This circle here is called an in-circle. And an in-circle can always be drawn whenever you have a triangle. And what you're going to do is you're going to find the angle bisectors of all of the three points, and then you're going to meet at the middle. This middle will be the middle of your circle. So this is called an in-circle. I don't think the term is in the O-level syllabus, but the properties of an angle bisector is. So this is important. So this is going to be an angle bisector. And we now know that X, Y, Z is an equilateral triangle. What's the properties of an angle bisector? It chops an angle in half. So this means that O, Y, C1 is 30 degrees. Or if you like, this is 60 as well. But for me, for now, I'm going to use 30. Now, all of these are tangent points. So we have formed two right angle triangles with an angle of 30 degrees. We can use trigo. So I'm going to work out what is OY and PY respectively. Let's start off with OY. For OY, I'm going to use the whole triangle of OYC1, and this will be sine. Sine 30 degrees is equals to A over OY. Sine 30 is half, so OY is 2A. Next will be PY. Same thing, sine 30. Okay, this will be B over PY. PY, 2B. And if you get these two parts, you'll get one mark for your question. Now, we're going to find an equation because we do need to figure out what is the ratio. So I'm interested in A is to B or A over B. And then I'll be able to compute what is my ratio. Looking at this, one of the only lengths in this whole entire figure that you can justifically find a point is actually OY. So I'm going to write OY in terms of the two lengths that I've just found. So OY is actually OP plus PY. We have a few of the values. So we know that OY is 2A. OP we wait first, but we know that PY is 2B. What is OP? If you have issues looking at this, we go back into the diagram. What is OP? This boils back down to those kind of very common questions where you see two circles touching each other and you have a line joining the centers of these two circles. This, two, this line OP in the center is just the radius of both circles because any line that connects two centers of a circle is the radius. So this is B, this is A. So therefore, OP is A plus B. And right now we can write the ratio. So A equals to 3B. A over B is one, three over one. And that's the answer. If not one is to three, three is to one. So this is the answer. So this question is a bit difficult. I hope people can do it. Next question I want to tackle, 23. The Pac-Man question. So this is the last question of the whole paper. This question was, for my students, was pretty badly done as usually like, because last question. And also this question is not as simple as it seems. Uh, you can write your answer in ratio form. Uh, it's actually the same thing. It doesn't really matter. So three is to one or three over one. Both was okay. Because both are ratios. 23. So how do you do this question? Oh, uh, just, just to touch on this point, uh, because it is three over one, you cannot write just three because that's a number. You need to write three over one or three is to one, either one. Okay, good question. So we're going to touch on 23. This is the last question for paper one. Then we'll move on to paper two. Yep. So for this question, how do we do it? Okay, I'm going to look at the Pac-Man. Yeah, here. So we have a Pac-Man down here, and this Pac-Man is going to eat this power fruit. And your job is to actually figure out what is the area of the shaded region, okay? The area of the power fruit that has been eaten up. A lot of people couldn't do this or didn't know how to start. 
to be very honest, the Pac-Man and the Power Fruit part, not important. The only thing that we're interested in is the figure in the center, OXPY. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to isolate out this figure. So I'm going to draw a very rough one here. Apologies for the horrendous drawing. I still got A for my art. So this is O X P Y. And I'm going to draw the arcs as shown in the diagram. So one is here, one is here. I'm going to label them so that it helps me with my labeling later. I'm going to call this Q and I'm going to call this R. And my job is to figure out what is the lip in the center. What is the area of this lip? If you do enough of area sector questions, this kind of diagram should jump to you straight away. And you know that you need to find what is the shape of the leaf. What do I mean by the leaf? Okay, leaf is a term that I use. Huh? It's not an official geometrical term. It's just a term that I, I make it easy to understand. The first one we're going to find is this. This is the easiest one to find because we have every single piece of information. The one in red. This is five and this is pi over three. So if you do enough of this kind of questions, this leaf shape down here is always taking the area of a sector minus the area of a triangle. So let's work it out. So area of x, r, y, and this will be equals to the area of the sector. So I'll just take the sector minus the triangle. For the area of the sector, half r square theta. So half five square pi over three minus half a b sine c. Half five square sine. Work this out. Now take note that because we are doing trigo within this question, Every one of your angles all need to change into the radian mode. You're not allowed to use angles. Yes, calculator must be in the radian mode. So like this, yeah, just nice when I said it. <laughs> okay, thank you for asking. 25 over 6 pi minus 25 over 4 square root 3. So this is my style. My style is to always leave the answers in exact form because I hate dealing with decimal points. And the chances of doing the rounding mistake very high. So for me, I kiasu, I always leave my answer in exact form. Like this. Next, what we're going to do. Okay, this next part is a bit difficult. That is where the challenging portion of the question comes in. Most people can find this. This is one mark, three mark. The problem is the rest. Because we do not know the area of the, we do not know the radius of the power roof. That is a very big problem that we have right now. How do we figure out the radius of the power of fruit? The information is given in the question, the clue, which is right here. OX is perpendicular to XY, or XP, sorry. So this line. So it's a, I know it's a very random statement, but this point is very important. The reason is because if we know that OX is perpendicular to XP, this means that we can form a right triangle. So right here. So what we can do is we can chop this figure up in half, like this, and we can find what is this side. Okay, this is the difficult thing because it's not very obvious that we need to use trigo to work out what is the length of XP. So this is how you do it. And this line that you're going to draw in the center is actually an angle bisector as well. So you're going to chop the pi over three into two. So let's work out XP now. So this is XP's calculation. This will be tangent pi over six. This is equals to XP over six, over five, sorry. Okay, same thing, I will leave in exact form. XP is five over root three. Now, if you're not used to doing things in exact form, then by all means, write everything in decimal points. But just be very careful. If you're moving down from part to part, of your moving from calculation to calculation, please remember to use at least five to six different significant figures. Do not ever use rounded off numbers. You will get the question wrong. You will lose marks for rounding. So XP is that. And now you can actually work out what is angle XPY. XPY is actually part of a four-sided figure. 
So we all know that four-sided figures add up to 360 degrees. Okay, so 360 degrees or 2 pi. So we will take, I'll find xp. Sorry, I'll answer your question in a while. Lah. Hang on. Lah. So angle xpy okay, is 2 pi, which is 360 degrees of a whole figure, minus pi over 3, minus both of the angles down there are 90 degrees. So basically it's just pi. Pi because 90, 90 add up to 180. So this is 2 pi over 3. Okay, uh, let me answer the question. Where did this pi over 6 come from? So this pi over 6 came from cutting this angle here in half. Oops, sorry. Oh my God. Uh, cutting this angle in half. So because OP is a angle bisector, we take pi over 3 divided by 2 pi over 6. And because there is a right triangle down here, tangent, and you'll get your answer. Okay, so this is the calculation. Uh, in case someone asks where this pi come from, let me explain again. Uh. The pi is basically 180 degrees. And where is this 180? It's from this 90 down here and this 90 down here. So we get this. And now we can find the area using the exact same method. So we're going to, from this two, use the sector minus the triangle and we can get the answer. Okay, so the leaf, it will be half. Same thing, I write everything in exact form. Huh? So 5 over root 3 square, 2 pi over 3, minus half 5 over root 3 squared, sine 2 pi over 3. Okay, and we're done. Completed. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to call different things. I'll call this happy face and call this happy face with a tongue. Okay, the question is asking you to figure out what's the total area. So total. Okay, it's just the happy face plus the happy face with the top. And the final answer here it will be 287.38 cm square. And done. Whole question completed. Okay. And we're done with paper one. Good, just nice one hour. <laughs> okay, so thank you for those that are still here. Hope you're benefiting from this session. I'm trying to cover as many different topics as I can, especially choosing the more challenging topics. So take note a few things. Number one, the solutions have already been posted onto the Overmark channel. So if you need the step-by-step -step marking scheme, it's all there. Everything is provided already. This session is just to for me to explain some of the more difficult things that is a little bit difficult to actually type out. Therefore, uh, why this session is being conducted. Now, we're going to move into the paper two. So paper two is honestly a lot easier than paper one. I'm going to cover all the questions there. The, I'm going to leave out one question, okay, because hindsight thinking about it, I'm not going to touch question 11 because that is the posting uh, problems in real world context question. I, I'm not going to touch that uh, because that question is not very difficult. I'm just going to guide you through the question later at the very end. And then uh, the rest, I want to focus a bit. I want to focus a little bit on the vectors question and the congruency similarity question, which is question seven and question nine, because these are the two worst done questions in this whole paper. So let's go into paper two and let's begin. So I'm just going to continue. Okay, let's go. So paper two. So the first question I want to tackle will be this particular uh, prob probability question as it was pretty badly done for majority of my students. So I assume that uh, a lot of people are not good with probability. So let's look at probability for today. So there are five number five balls numbered one to five placed in a box. A game involves a player drawing two balls, one after the other, without replacement. This is a very important keyword, without replacement. So one tip for probability questions is to always go back uh, and go and look for where in the question says without replacement or with replacement. Why is this important? 
because the way that we tabulate our answers at the very back later is we'll, we'll play with this without replacement concept. So a player wins the game if the product, another keyword product, of the two ball numbers add up to be an odd number. So a product becomes odd okay, and you will win a prize. The question is asking you for a possibility diagram to show the possible outcomes. Some students of mine drew a tree diagram, which is not true. Okay, it's not correct. Huh? This is a possibility diagram. So this is a table. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a simple box like this. In exams, please use a ruler. Please be as neat as possible. But we do not need to measure the dimensions. Huh? We just need to be neat. And we can get it. So what we're going to do is, because there are two outcomes that are going to happen, so the first one is going to be the first ball pick, and then the second one will be the second ball pick, like this. So I'm going to split both the rows and columns into five different sections. So one, two, three, four, and same thing on top. One, two, three, and four. And I'm going to label all the different axes. So this is one, two, three, four, five. My red numbers are labels, huh? So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Take note that we are doing a product. Now, this question is very unique because we are calculating a product. So you're allowed to actually tabulate what are all the multiplications. If the question says that, oh, uh, they never tell you anything about a product, they just tell you like two balls are being taken, you do not know whether you're taking a sum, subtraction or what, list out the combination. So we write it like one comma two like that. Okay, those are for those kind of questions. For this kind of question, we are doing a product. So it's actually correct to compute the calculation. So we're going to write it out. So this is two, three, four, five. 6, 8, and 10, 12, 15, 20. And this is a mirror image. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, 20. Now, take note, huh? I have intentionally left that whole middle diagonal there blank. There is a very good reason why. If Anyone fills up the numbers there. Obviously, I know it's one, two, three, four, eight. Sorry, one, four, nine, sixteen, and twenty-five. If anyone fills up those numbers, you will get the question wrong. Simple reason without replacement. Is it possible to draw two number one balls? No. So these boxes should be left blank. And this should be the answer. So a few things are huh? number one, if you write the combination. Okay, you will not get the question correct as well because the question specifically says that this is a product. And if you fill up every, anything along the diagonal, you will get the question wrong as well because that is not true. Okay, we come to the interesting parts, which is this tree. So the ones that were badly done will be the part B and part C. So find a fraction in the simplest form for the probability that a player wins a prize. So we just go back into the table and look for all of the odd numbers, which is 3, 5, and 15. These are my odd numbers. Answer is 6 over 20, because there are 20 possible combinations. So answer is 3 over 10, or 6 over 20. Please remember to simplify. <coughs> We're going to the difficult one. Okay, One or two players win a prize. So how does this work? I'm going to write down in terms of W and L. So W means win and L means loser. So what are the possible combinations of two people playing this game? Okay, so we have WL plus LW. Why plus? Because these are two different scenarios. So we add up and then we're going to take the multiplication because both of them, uh, they will affect each other. So therefore, uh, this is a multiplication. And then the addition is because two different cases. We're going to work out the fractions for the two of them. So the W down there should be 6 over 20, which we have computed above. What is the loss? Now, the loss means that you have every other possible combination out there. And this should be 14 over 20. Let me explain something right now. Because some people made this mistake. Some people said that it is 14 over 19. This is wrong. 
So a lot of people thought that the 20 down here should be a 19. No. Let me explain why. Because these two are different players playing this game. Whatever the person one plays and whatever the person one does do not affect player number two. So player one has 20 different chances. Player two also has 20 different chances. So they do not affect each other. And therefore the ratio is should be 20. For those kind of questions where they say like, oh, player one and player two will be affected by each other. Like for example, they say that, oh, uh, whatever ball that player one takes out, you will not be thrown in for player two. Ah, then your probability is slightly different. Your denominator changes from 20 to something else. For this case, there are two different games going on. So therefore the probability should be 20 in the denominator. And the answer is 21 over 50. Hope this is clear. Last one is part C. So the question is asking you to compute uh, what is the uh, probability for the least one, at least one out of two players win a prize. How do you work this question out? Now, if you go and count the combinations, right, there's actually quite a few. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to do the converse of this statement. So the opposite of this statement is saying who do not win any prize. And we're going to take one minus the probability of not winning. When does this work? Because one is the total cases of every possible case. And the only outlier in this question down here is actually the case of not winning. Because if you do not win, or if you win something, means you're part of the condition. And not winning anything at all means both people not winning will be out of this conversation. So to work this out, it's just 1 minus 14 over 20, 14 over 20. Same reason as on top. Same thing is 20 because these two are different games. Answer is 51 over 100. And that's the answer. Next one I want to do, 2D. Ah, okay, this one. So this question down here, Although it looks very harmless, but this question was horrendously done for many, many, many of my students. Uh, out of my 30 students, I think only two people got it right. And I believe if people were to try this question for the very first time, a lot of people will make the exact same mistake unless you know of this trick out there. So the trick comes from these two statements down here. 3B equals to 4A and 2C equals to 5A. A lot of people thought that this becomes three is to four. So wait, uh, a lot of people say that B is to A is three over four. C is to A is two is to five. Is this correct? No. Okay, this is wrong. It's the same mistake that a lot of people make in the vectors topic whenever they give you something of this nature, a lot of people will say like, oh, okay, B is three units, four, A is four units. No, you do need to change this into fractions. And that's where you can see your ratio. So please be very careful. Whenever you do such questions, write them in terms of the ratio. I believe this is like a primary school concept. So don't really know why people are making mistakes like this. It's okay. So 3B is to A, sorry, 3B equals to 4A. So this means that B over A equals to 4 over 3. And that is the ratio. Okay. Wait, did I mess up? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 correct. Okay, and uh, 2C equals to 5A. And this is C over A equals to 5 over 2. And now we can form common number. So this one goes back into very simple concepts. Three, A, four is the three, sorry about that. And C is to A, five is to two. So what you need to do now is to make the A the common number, which is six, and then you just multiply accordingly. Answer is six is to eight is to 15. I'm not gonna do part two, because if you can do part one, you can do part two. So the one I want to focus on is just talking about the ratios. Please do not get tricked by such questions because it's a very common trick that always appears in factors.
Next, 3D. Uh, this one, another one that is horrendously done because a lot of people make mistakes in this question here. The rest of the question is not important. I just want to focus on this question here. So the question says that you have a club that is investing $120,000 in an account. We pays a compound interest at a rate of 2% per annum. Very important, huh? compounded monthly. Find the total amount that this uh, company can actually withdraw the month at the end of four years. Okay, so we all know the formula for compound interest. So this is total is equals to P1 plus R over 100 to the power of N. Let's talk about the different numbers down there, uh, the different variables, sorry. We're going to talk about the N first. Now this number N here, or this letter N, sorry about that. This letter N here, this is the number of times. Take note, uh, this is different from the T in your simple interest. Simple interest PRT, the T is the number of years. For this N here, this is the number of times that you're compounding. Take note that this 2% down here is being compounded monthly and you're doing it for four years. So this means you have four times 12. So this is N, four times 12. A lot of people will forget two times 12. So just take note of that. Now, the one that uh, a lot of people didn't do, which is this R here. Okay. Now, this R, you must be super careful about it. Take note that the rate, the percentage down here that you are given is per annum. Annum is one year. But you are calculating it on a monthly basis. So, by putting just 2% down there, you are going to get the question wrong. Because this 2% is supposed to be split up into the whole entire year. So this R is actually 2 over 12. Uh, this is the one that is the most commonly mistaken one, 2 over 12. So please be super careful. Read your questions very carefully. Make sure that if you are doing compound interest, make sure your R is always per annum compounded yearly. If it's a yearly thing, then you do not need to do any division. And then if it's a monthly thing, then you need to check your rate. If your rate is a yearly rate, you need to divide it by the number of months. If you do not, you will get the question wrong. Okay, the answer is just 12998.5.79. So this is the two that I want to focus on. Next, 5A. This is properties of circle. So we're down to two more questions, and uh, three more questions, and we are done for today. So properties of circle. Ah, okay. This question is not very difficult, but I just wanted to go through this topic because I do know that this is a common pitfall for many students. So let's look at this. A, B, C, D, E lies on a circle with center O. The center PQ is a tangent to the circle at A. A, D is a diameter of the circle. C, E, D is equal to X and A, E, D equals to Y. This question is slightly more challenging because there are no numbers. Everything is in terms of algebra. So how do we work this out? Okay, we're going to just compute every single one uh, as I go through. Take note that for all angle property questions, we do need to write the reason. There are students out there that are at this point still not writing reasons for every single statement that you prove. Take note that if you do not write any reasons, you will lose marks in exams. Please be very, very careful. The first one, CAD. So CAD is down here. So by just looking at the figure, we can see a butterfly. Take note now, butterfly condition. One, two, three, four. So this is the butterfly. Now take note that the butterfly has a very special property. The butterfly must all four corners touch the circle. That is the condition of the butterfly because there are other scenarios where the butterfly does not touch the four corners of the circle and everyone just happily say that it is angles in the same segment. No, the four corners of the butterfly must touch the circumference of the circle. That is the first condition. And the second one down there will be that uh, you cannot write the word butterfly in exams because butterfly is a mnemonic that people say to memorize. The property should be angles in the same segment. 
So the answer is x degrees. Okay, answer, uh, you need to explain us. Uh, so angles, oh, sorry, that tends to take the same. Okay, this is the answer for part one. Part two, COD. I'm going to erase my working here. So COD, so I'm going to draw the line of that there. So something like this. Oh, sorry. So we should my bad. Okay, so we have something like this. Now, take note that AOD is the diameter of the circle. It's kind of given. And then we have a very special triangle that appeared. So one, two, three. This is a very special shape. Whenever you see such a shape in exams, this is angle at center equals to two times angle at circumference. So the answer is two X degrees. And you do need to write the full reason, angle at center equals to two times angle at circumference. I'm not gonna write it now. Okay, I'm just going to go through how to do every question. It's a lot faster. Next, EAO. So we're going to find where is that. EAO is this angle down here. How do you work this out? Now, a few things that you can use straight away. Take note that AD is the diameter of the circle. So this means that triangles EAD is 90 degrees. This is 90 degree triangle. Okay. So are there things that we can use in this figure? Yes, there are. So a few things. Take note that this is x, okay? Uh, this whole thing is 90. This is y. We can work this out. So it's just 180 minus 90 minus y. Simplify that down. You will get 90 minus y. And the reason is because angles in a semicircle. Next, uh, EDC. So EDC, I'm going to draw the line again. Oops, sorry. EDC, like this. Okay, so we are looking for that particular angle. Mm, ah, okay. So we know that this here is now uh, 90 minus Y. This angle down here is X. And we are looking for... We are looking for this. Okay, well, I'll come to your question in a while. Thank you for the question. So this ABC, uh, ACDE is actually a four-sided figure. So we have angles in a cyclic quadrilateral. So angles opposite of our angles are cyclic quadrilateral. So we do need to, oh, uh, sorry. We take 180 minus 90 minus Y minus X. And you will get your answer. Answer is 180, hey, sorry, 90 plus Y minus X. This is your answer. So I repeat again, now the answer is 180 minus 90 minus Y minus X. Take note that your 90 minus Y must put in a bracket so that you remember to multiply the minus sign in or else people, you'll get this question wrong. Okay, to answer your question, uh, we need to write reasons even though they never ask us to show our proof. Yes, you do. So for angle property questions, we do need to show reasons for everything in general. Anytime you calculate angles in like whatever chapter, just write, just to be very safe. Even trigo, uh, vectors, any, you know, no vectors, sorry. Uh, should we go? You do need to write reason as to like angles at a point, angles on a straight line. Just write. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to write just to be kiasu a bit. Okay. The last one is EAQ. Okay, it's this one down here. Now, some people did, when they did my mock paper, because they all take AMF, some people said alternate segment theorem. Uh, no, cannot, because alternate segment theorem is not in the syllabus. Uh, you do need to work out why this is uh, y. La. Okay, for those that take AMF, you should know that this is y degrees because of alternate segment theorem uh, with this corresponding here. But for the EMF students that don't take AMF, the very simple reason is that PAQ is tangential to the circle and OA is the radius of the circle. This means that OAQ is 90. So we'll take 90 minus 90 minus y. Answer is y. So I stress again, huh? okay, for all angle property questions, you do need to write reasons. Please use whatever is within the syllabus. Do not 
uh, straight out of the syllabus. Do not use your alternate segment theorem uh, for those that take AMF and you learn the property before. Okay. Very good. We're good in time. Okay. Two more questions and then we are done. So the one I want to go through is the congruency similarity question. And then the last one is the vectors question. So these two questions are the most difficult questions in the whole paper. So I'm going to focus a little bit of time on this. And I do know that these two topics are kind of the more like uh, people don't like these topics. Lah. So I'm going to spend a bit more time on them, especially the second pages of both questions because those are the more difficult parts of both questions. Question seven. So in the diagram, ABCD is a square and EFABHG is a parallelogram. The lines BC, EG, HI intersect at the point H or F, sorry. E and F are the midpoints of AD and BC respectively. And four DH is equals to three DC. You need to show that EDH and BFG are congruent. So first thing I like to do for congruent questions is to always highlight or identify where are the triangles. So this is one. Oh my God, sorry, so ugly. Uh, one, two, three. And the last the one is BFG. So one, two, three. Oh, yo. Okay, so since we have a bit of time, let's do a bit of a recap for this chapter. For congruency similarity questions, take note that for congruency, there are four tests. SSS, ASE, SES, RHS. Whatever floats your boat. Okay, whichever method you want. The easiest one for this one here will be RHS. So you can choose whatever property that you want to use, but just be very careful whenever you are doing such a question. So since we have a little bit of time and I want to focus on this topic a little bit, I'm going to open up my notes. Uh, one question that I'm interested in. Wait, uh, let me find it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, here. Sorry, give me one second. Uh. Ah, okay. Okay, I hope people can see this. Okay, I just want to run through this very, very quickly. This is from my free note series. I, I know it's not out. Uh, this topic is out, by the way. Uh, but I'm still modifying the topic. So very soon, they'll be out. Maybe about one more week. Sorry about that. Okay, so for congruency, right? Take note that there are four. SSS, ASA, SAS, and RHS. All these four are what you can use to prove for congruent triangles. For similar triangles, there are the three tests down there. Triple A, corresponding side same ratio, and a ratio of two pairs of corresponding sides are the same, and one included angle in between. So there are three down there you can choose. The most common similarity proof is always triple A or double A, either one. This is the most important page out there. Trust me, this is very, very, very important because for all proof questions, we do need to write justification. Don't care whether the questions say or not, Justifications are very important. So how do we prove this? Uh, what are the different types lah, out there? There are three that you need to remember. Number one, okay, whenever the question gives you a piece of information, you can use the word given. So take note, lah, the word given is very special. It only works for questions when it is literally given to you. Whenever you need to perform any calculation, uh, then you cannot use the word given because it's not given to you, ma. Okay. The second one is those that deal with the common side. So anything that deals with a common side or common angle, uh, you can just say that uh, this angle is a common angle. This ang uh, side is a common side. Good enough. And number three, anything that you have done calculations, you do need to write reasons. So any of your angle properties, any of your circle properties, anything out there, you do need to write the reasons as to why something happens. Last thing that I want to mention will be the orientation of the way that you write your angles and your triangles. You need to make sure that it follows the orientation of the question and you need to follow everything. If everything is going in a clockwise direction, all your angles must label in a clockwise. If you're going in an anti-clockwise direction, everything must be in the anti-clockwise direction. So just take note of this. Please do not make such mistakes in exams. 
So we're going to go into this question here. So we're going to prove the congruency. So there are three things we're going to prove. We're going to prove the R, H, and S. So the first one is going to be the angle. So this is angle EDH is equals to angle BFG. And this is 90. The reason is because these are perpendiculars, all right angle triangles. Why? Okay, this is the first R. Next, we're going to say that E, oh, sorry. We're going to say that EH is equals to BG. What's the reason why? So if you go back into your diagram, EH is equal to BG because they are sides of a parallelogram. That's the property of a parallelogram. So EH, take note that I'm also following all the orientation. Huh? EH is equal to BG. And this is sides of a parallelogram. Sides of a Okay, this is the hypotenuse side. And the very last one is going to be two more lengths. Okay, uh, we're going to use ED equals to BF. Why? Because we know that E and F are midpoints of the sides of a square. So I'm going to write that down. So ED equals to BF. And the reason is because E and F are midpoints. of a square, the size of a square, sorry. So this is S. Okay, and last statement, very important, you must write the reason or the proof that you have used by the RHS congruency test, okay, triangles EDH, EDH is congruent to triangle BFG. Finish. So some people will ask me, how do I actually identify what are the orientations that I need to follow? Now take note that when questions give you like why this is this is congruent or why that is that is uh, similar, all of them will be already in the same order. So for me, rule of thumb, very simple. I'll just go in this way long. So for example, I'll just, all my angles, I'll just follow. I'll just say like E, D, H, and then B, F, G. So if I choose like one, two, three, I must do one, two, three. Can see? So if I'm doing EH, right, then I know I take the first letter, third letter. So I'll go first letter, third letter. You go in this, this way, right? You convert or get the question correct. And you'll never need to worry about misorientating your triangle. Part two, the question is asking you to prove the similarities. So there are two ways of doing this. You can use double A or you can use the ratios of the same size. So the, I'm going to use the ratio one because it's a lot simpler. So first thing, take note that E and F are midpoints of your square. So we can write the ratios properly. CH over AE is equals to CF over AB. Now take note that I'm also following the orientation of all of these letterings. Huh? I'll prove it to you. One, two, three, one, two, three. I choose CH, which is one, two over AE, one, two equals to CF13 over AB13. So all this follows the properties. And you do need to explain, okay, you just state that E and F, three point. Done. Next, we're going to prove the right angle triangle. Okay, so we do know that these two triangles are made out of right angle triangles. So C, H, C, F, so, uh, angle HCF equals to angle EAB, 90 degrees. Okay, so just say that this is right angle. Okay, so this is your double S. This is A. So you just need to state by the SAS similarity test, Uh, triangle CHF. Now, take note of a few things I want to stress. Number one, uh, writing SAS is okay. I do know that SAS is a congruency test, but you can see that SAS is also considered as a similarity test. A lot of schools are teaching it this way, so I'm just going to follow. Same thing for triple S. Triple S is where all your ratios are the same. Make sure your proof is correct. 
Second thing I want to mention, <clears throat> the last statement when I write, CHF uh, is similar to AEV. Take note that similar, you cannot just anyhow throw random symbols for similar. No, uh. similar you need to write. You need to spell out full. And we're done with these two parts. So these two parts are simple. It's the behind, they are a little bit more on the difficult side. So let's go through those three questions, which is this. Now, most of the time, is it, con is it considered as showing if we write out as the ratio CH to AE equals to half? No, cannot. Uh, you cannot just write CH over AE equals to half because that is not comparing two sides. Uh, because the property states that the ratio of two different sides is the same ratio. So just stating one doesn't work. Yeah, it, it doesn't work at all. Okay. So uh, find the numerical value of the following. So whenever you see questions with this, which deals with an like area or triangle of numerical values or fractions, most of the time, these are kind of killer questions and they are pretty tough. Uh, I cannot justify for all different types of questions out there. What are the standards? But I can tell you what are the common things that a lot of people like to test. A lot of teachers like to show lah, okay? Sorry, is it wrong? Did I make a mistake? CH over AE. Wait on. CH over AE. Wait. Wait. Hang on. Huh? CH. Oh, wait. I think I made a mistake. Sorry. Uh, CF. Sorry, uh, give me a second. I think I made an error. CF over AE. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm correct. Yeah, because you are half of each other, ma. One, two, three. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I think I see my mistake. Wait on. Ah, okay, correct. Uh, the reason is because... See? Yeah, okay. So the reason is because here. So 4DH is equals to 3DC, right? So this will tell you that this is three units, this is one unit. Yeah, so this is two, this is two. So one is to two. Okay, yeah, sorry about it. Okay, so back to this. Uh, DH over EG. So how do we prove this? So actually we're gonna use whatever I shown just now. So uh, for DH equals to three DC, this will tell you that dh over dc is 3 to 4, so which is exactly what I said just now. Now, take note uh, that uh, from, the tri from the question, right, we know that triangles edh, sorry, edh is congruent to bfg. Okay, so these two triangles are congruent. Now, we know that dh is equals to fg. So this line is equal to this line because they are congruent. So the question is asking you to figure out what is dh is to eg. Uh, you see, uh, eg is made up of ef plus fg. And we also got the ratio of fg, which is equal to dh. So therefore, to solve this question, dh, oops, wrong color, dh over eg is equal to dh over ef plus fg which is just 3 over 3, 4 plus 3, 4 plus 3, 3 over 7, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is one of them. Yeah, this one is not very difficult. It's the bottom two that is a little bit, uh, yeah, a bit tougher. Okay, so tip, uh, whenever you see triangles and they ask you to prove uh, same triangles, there are always a few very common methods that we'll use. First one will be same height. Whenever you have triangles sharing the same height, one of your lengths, the lengths will always be ratios of each other, which is what I'm going to prove later. The second one, uh, the most common one out there will be to use uh, L1 over L2 is equals to A1, sorry, L1 over L2 squared is equals to A1 over A2. But take note that this only works for similar triangles. You cannot just anyhow bomb triangles. It is for that. And number three, for the more messed up questions, like more difficult ones, half AB sine C. So these are the three. Or you calculate using half times length times breadth. Lah. 
Okay. For this particular question here, B, G, uh, F, and B, E, F. So I'm going to go into the diagram and go and find where are these two triangles. So I'm going to erase all my uh, working. So B, G, F, and B, E, F. So I'm going to highlight both triangles. So one, two, three. So take note that these two triangles down here, number one, they are not similar. Huh? So a lot of people give me a one over L2. No, it huh? doesn't work that way. Huh? Okay, these two triangles here, they share the same height. So what we're going to do is we're going to write out the area formula for the triangle. So that's what I'm going to do. Huh? Okay, let's work it out. So uh, area of triangle BGF over area of triangle BEF okay, equals to half. Okay, now I'm going to call my height. Uh, okay, pretty, pretty clear for both triangles, the height is BF. Uh, so the height is BF and the length of BGF is just FG over half. The height of the triangle is also BF multiplied by EG. Uh, Sorry, EF, my bad. Okay, and take note that now, because they share the same height, can cancel. And the halves will obviously cancel. So like that, cancel, cancel, cancel. And we're now left with FG over uh, EF, 3 is to 4. So a lot of people gave me 9 over 16, which is wrong. Okay, answer should be 3 over 4. There's no L1 over L2 here, because nowhere says that these two triangles are similar. Okay, the only thing that we know is that these two triangles are both right angled triangles, lah, but they never say anywhere that they are similar, so cannot just anyhow assume. Okay, last one the area of EBGH. Uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to use every single numerical value in the whole entire question. So, the using everything above, uh, we're going to start playing with all the ratios. So, let's work it out. So area, so the first one uh, on top, so area of triangle EBGH over the area of ABCD. Sorry, no triangle. Okay, so EBGH. Now EBGH is actually a parallelogram. So what I'm going to do is that instead of calculating the area of a parallelogram, I'm going to calculate the area of a triangle and multiply by two. So what are the things that we're going to use? We're going to use two times half the triangle length. Huh? We're going to use EG multiplied by BF. Why is it we can do that? Because these are numerical values that you have. Please do not write ratios where you do not have the value. Huh? That's a bit silly because you will, you will get definitely very stuck in the question. The next one, we are looking for the square ABCD. We have the ratio. Okay, this is, we're going to use AD. Hey, sorry, times CD. And every single thing down here have values. So let's just plug everything in. So two times half, EG is four, you know, seven, sorry. And BF is two divided by four times four. Final answer is seven over eight. And this is how you do this question. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so thank you for those that are still here. Okay, we are wrapping up to the very last question, which is the most difficult topic in the syllabus, vectors. So I, I don't know whether the people stay for this topic. <laughs> okay, but yes, I understand that this topic is pretty challenging. This question alone is also pretty difficult, especially part C. So we're going to focus a little bit on time on that. So that is the remaining half an hour of my session. Now, before we kickstart this vector topic, I'm actually going to do a little summary of the vector question, the topic first, then we will touch the questions. So I'm going to find my notes, uh, which is this one here. So this um, set of notes that you see, this black piece of paper that you see down here, uh, it's already in the channel. I've uploaded it during the midterm series. This is actually my 2021 version of my free handwritten notes. I'm actually compiling at the moment the 2022 version. 
uh, I'll upload it when I'm finished with it. Uh, if let's say I not, do not finish it, then obviously I won't upload. Okay, but this will definitely suffice for the whole entire uh, syllabus because everything is the same. So the topic that I put, wait, hang on, this missing vectors. Sorry, not this one. Uh, wait, uh. Where is it? Ah, okay, sorry. This one contains vectors. The, the, the version down there don't have. So I'm going to summarize the whole vector topic first, then we will tackle all the different questions down there. So this topic on vectors is the kind of the most difficult topic in the whole entire syllabus. That's why it's kept at the very last topic. And a lot of students uh, actually are very weak at the vectors topic. Uh, for I, of, course, of course, I understand why, because uh, it is not the most uh, intuitive topic out there. You do need to take a bit of effort to sit down there and actually work it through. Then the topic will be a lot easier. So suggestions for this topic, if you are having struggles with this topic, take some time to go and read through the topic again and go and practice those very simple questions first before tackling those uh, prelim level questions, which are a lot more difficult. Another thing, uh, this topic here will link to, for those students that are interested uh, or you're planning to go to A-levels and you're planning to take H2 math, this topic will come back and it will come back as an even scarier monster. Uh, it's a, one of the more difficult chapters in the A-level syllabus as well. So the O-level vectors, you do need to master it before moving on into the A-level syllabus. So these are just little warnings for you. So I'm going to summarize this topic very, very quickly in the next five minutes, and then we'll run through the topic. So the first thing is the vectors. Take note that all vectors contain a magnitude and a direction. It's the same thing as your scalar vectors uh, in your physics, if you take physics. So vectors contain a magnitude, which is the numerical value or the length of the line and the direction. That's why we have the arrow. Now take note that for vectors presentation, okay, we always need to draw the little squiggly line under every letter, not above, uh, underneath. Okay, this squiggly line here will be the tilde symbol. This is to tell people that you're writing during exams. Next is talking about the negative vectors. So for negative vectors is when you change your direction. So when you have a change in direction, like for example, you're no longer going from A to B, you're going from B to A, Okay, you need to flip your direction. A very simple analogy that I like to give students is taking the MRT trains in Singapore. So for example, if you're going from Jurong East to Boon Lay, uh, why these two examples? Because I stay around here. So Jurong East to Boon Lay, if you're taking the train from Jurong East to Boon Lay, it is the different train from Boon Lay to Jurong East. Okay, and every time I give this analogy, students will say, no, la, the train go back and then come back. No, 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 no. For, for now, we'll just assume that the train going from Jurong East to Boon Lay is different from the train moving from Boon Lay to Jurong East. Next concept is position vectors. Now, this question doesn't have any position vectors inside, but take note that position vectors are very common in exams. Position vectors are always written in a coordinate form. Okay, so like for example, your coordinate geometry chapter, they're always written in that form. Now take note that you can always rewrite it into the column vector form. And take note that all position vectors are always with respect to your origin. So for example, if you have a point P, which is like 2, 1, okay, it's always with respect to your origin point. That's why it's for zero uh, OP, that's your vector. For the magnitude calculation, this is using Pythagoras theorem. Okay, it's just rise over run and you will get it out. Last one down here is the addition of vectors. So this is the most important concept out here. Uh, whenever you're adding two vectors together, it's the same thing. I'm going to give an analogy using uh, MRT stations in Singapore. So I'm going to talk about going from Ishun to Jurong East, then Jurong East to Boon Lay. So if you're living under a rock and you've never taken the MRT stations, or never taken the MRT in Singapore before, okay, yeah? so Isun to Jurong East is on the red line. Jurong East to Boon Lay is on the green line. Let's say, for example, if I want to travel from Isun to Boon Lay, how, how do I do that? Is there a train going from Isun to Boon Lay? No. What you need to do is you need to take from Ishun to Jurong East. Your Jurong East is your junction. 
went from Jurong East to Boon Lay. And therefore, that is the trend that you take. So for example, for this case, if A is Ishun, B is Jurong East, C is Boon Lay, we're going to travel from Ishun to Boon Lay, uh, Ishun to Jurong East, which is vector A, and then from Jurong East to Boon Lay, which is B. So in total, your journey is A plus B. Take note, uh, if let's say, for example, if the train is moving in the opposite direction, so you have like Jurong East to uh, Ishun to Jurong East, but unfortunately, you have a train moving from Boon Lay to uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Boon Lay to Jurong East instead of Jurong East to Boon Lay, uh, then you need to change the orientation of the train. You need to take the opposite train. Therefore, you put a minus sign. Last concept here is talking about scalar multiplications. So whenever you have a scalar multiple of something, this is dealing with parallel vectors and collinear vectors. So whenever you want to prove that our vectors are collinear, or you want to prove that vectors are parallel, we always use the common uh, scalar multiplication. Okay, we use the scalar uh, form to solve. So you're solving for the value of k. Now take note the difference between collinear and parallel. <clears throat> Parallel, there are no common points. Collinear, there is one common point. So whenever you're proving collinear, you do need to show that one of the points is common. Parallel don't need, I mean, parallel should not, should not be the case. Lah. Okay, and this is obviously for collinear vectors. So this is a very quick summary of this whole topic. Right now, I'm going to go through the whole entire question and I hope uh, it'll be a lot clearer when I go through. Now to speed up the process, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flash the answers straight away. Okay, but before I flash the answer, I'm going to go through first. Lah. Okay, so I'm not going to handwrite anymore Okay, because I'm running out of time. So in the diagram, OPQ is a triangle such that OP is equals to P, uh, OQ equals to Q, Q is the midpoint of OS, and R lies on OP produce such that 3PR equals to 2OP. The point T on PQ is such that PT to TQ is 3 to 5. Express in terms of P and or Q the vector of OS. So for OS, it's not difficult. Now tips for vector questions is whenever you are given a vector or you're asked to find a vector, I will always write the, I will always draw the direction that you're going. So you are very clear what direction of the MRT train you're taking and you do not mess up. So the vector that we're interested in is this line here and we're going in this direction, okay? So the question this says that Q is the midpoint of OS. So if we know that OQ is Q, so this means that QN is also Q. So therefore, from O to S is 2Q. Just take note that for printing, whenever we are print, like for, for us teachers or for us in exams, uh, whenever we are doing vectors, we always will bold the letter. Okay, but for you guys in exams, you cannot bow your letter in exams. So you do need to write the tilde symbol underneath to tell people that this is indeed a vector. Next is OR. Okay, so this one is a little bit tough. So how do you figure out what is OR? So OR is the whole entire length here. What did the question say? The question says that 3PR is equals to 2OP. Ah, so we can use this fact. Now, remember, I have gone through the question two part D. Remember that this one, when you write your ratios, you must be super, super, super careful. PR over OP is two over three. So this means that this is two units and this is three units. So we can see from here that PR is actually just, uh, PR is two thirds of P. Sum the two together. Answer is 5 over 3. Last one will be vectors. Okay. Oh, okay, next page. Uh, OT. Ah, okay. So for OT, this is a little bit uh, more challenging. Okay, so we're going to figure out what is OT first. So same thing, I'm going to draw my line. Okay, make sure I'm going in the right direction. Okay, then... A simple method that I always like to do is the trace the diagram, okay, and then it's the same thing like when you take the MRT uh, system in Singapore, and you go and say like, okay, for example, I'm at Ishun, and I want to go to Budle. I need to trace along the map to figure out my point of direction, mark. so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go take paths that I know and I can go, lah. so I can go from OP 
to PT. Like ah, okay. So it's literally just going from Yishun to Jurong East, then Jurong East to Bunle, just like that. Okay. Now, uh, obviously, there are many ways to reach T. Now, uh, there are, you, you can obviously go from, okay, if you know your map very well, uh, uh, you can go from Yishun to Ochum, then Ochum to Purple Line, then from the Purple Line, take the downtown line, then take the downtown line to the red line, then the red line go back to the green line, then the green line go back to Moonlight. Also can, sure, no problem, if you love the MRT station a lot. But for general cases here, we always take the shortest possible path. So we're going to go for the shortest possible path, which is from OP to PT. Or you can go from OQ to QT. Both also can. You'll get the same answer. So how do you work out what is PT? So the first thing is that you're given the ratio down here. PT is to TQ is 3 is to 5. So this one, nothing, uh, nothing sus about it. You can just write 3 is to 5. The problem now is that you do not know vector PQ. Uh, that is another problem. Huh? So what we're going to do now is I'm going to highlight vector PQ. Great. And we're going to find a path from P to Q. And the path is going to be from here to here. Okay. So take note, huh? we are going to write out what is vector PQ now. And vector PQ, take note, huh? OP is P. Uh, so we are taking the opposite direction. So it's negative P plus Q. And now we can find PT. This is 3 over 8 of this Q minus P. And therefore, OT is just summing up both of them together and you will get your final answer. So the final answer is 1 over 8, 5P plus 3Q. A common question that a lot of people will ask is, is it necessary to simplify like this? Uh, the answer is no. But for me personally, I like to simplify. A uh, very simple reason is because whenever you simplify things like this, when you do down your next few parts of the question, right, you will always try to look out for all of these simplification things. And that's how you prove your collinear, prove your similar triangle, use your similar height and everything. So this, this just nice will help me with part B and why I write it in this form. Because when I do the question later, you will realize that this 5P plus 3Q will appear again. And where? I'm going to show you now. So the question tells you that QU is equal to 10 over 9P minus 1 third Q. You need to show that OT and U are collinear points. So you need to show that the line is collinear. So going back into the diagram here, I'm just going to erase all of my working. So the question gives you QU. This is what the question gives you. So this line here. You need to prove that the vectors of OT, U are collinear. So obviously, you need to figure out what is the vector of TU. This is what you're missing. So TU is not difficult to find. We have this, right? You can find. Okay, this is just 5 over 8 of P, or Q minus P. Okay, if you're wondering why 5 over 8, because just now this is 3, this is 5. And we have QU. So we are looking for the vectors going from T to U. So we just add up 5 over 8 Q minus P plus 10 over 9p minus 1 third q. And we're going to get this particular term here. Now, if you simplify it, you will realize that you will get this, 5p plus 3q. Ah, and this is actually very similar to the one on top, down here. So what you can do now, you can write out your equation. OT is equals to ktu. So the thing note that the k is your scalar multiple. The k is the value that you need to find. You're going to equate both of them together. You're going to solve for the value of k. And how do you do that? You take 7 over 22 divided by 1 over 8. And you will get 7 over 9. This will tell you that OT is 7 over 9 of TU. And how can I confidently do it? It's because this whole entire vector portion of the question just vanishes. Okay, because they are equal. They are equal vectors, just that the number in front is just telling you how long that vector is going to be. And therefore here, 7 over 9, this is your multiple. And therefore, since OT and TU are scalar multiples of each other, this shows that T, OT, and U are collinear. Uh, of course, it's good to also say that T is a common point. So maybe uh, you would like to write that T is a common point. Now, another answer that I got uh, from students that did this question is to actually prove OU as well. 
also can. So some people found uh, what is OT, then they find the whole thing of OU, and then they show that they are scalar multiples of each other. Also can, you will get the question correct as well. Okay, as long as you show that there's a scalar multiplication, you will confirm get the question correct. Now we're going to the last three parts. Okay, these last three parts are pretty difficult. So bear with me while I slowly go through them and then we will officially end off today. So the question states that we need to find the vectors of RU over US. Okay, so we have the triangle down here. Trust me, whenever we are doing such a ratio, we will always figure out what are the vectors for these two. Now, RU is not difficult to find. So let's work out RU first. So R u down here is literally going from R to O and then from O to U. You can also choose to go from R to P, P to T, T to U. Also can. But uh, I think it will be easier if you go from R, O to O, U because then you'll add two vectors instead of three. If you go in this direction, you have all of the values and you can work it out. You will get 1 over 9, 6Q minus 5P. You will get this. Okay, that's for R u. Next, you can do US. It's the exact same thing. You go from U to O, O to S, and you have every single value as well, which is this. So when you go from U to O and O to S, take note that your calculations from the previous parts are all in the opposite direction because you're going from OT to TU. Now you're going from U to O. It's in the opposite direction. It's the same for RO. RO is the opposite of your OR. So all must have minus sign in front or else you will get the question wrong. And very, very conveniently, we want to fish out the common vectors so that when you do your fraction, it will cancel. So when you write into your fraction like this, the vector sections of the question will vanish and you're left with half. And that's the answer. So tip for this kind of questions is to always deal with uh, this case down here where you will cancel your vectors and you will always try to write out the ratios like this. It's either you use similar triangle or you apply the congruency question, the, the, the concepts just now, or you do it this way. Also can. Okay, we come to the two difficult parts, which is part two and part three. Part two especially. Uh, so part two, right? The question is OTQ... Uh, equals to or the area of OTQ over the area of all US. Okay, so this question is a little bit on our oof side. Okay, a few reasons. Very simple. Number one, uh, these two triangles here are not similar. I hope you established that. Uh, these two triangles are not similar, obviously. Uh, these two triangles here have no common height at all. Uh, unfortunately, you have no other direction. You, there's no common height. There is no common ratio. They are not similar. So how? No choice law, we brute force the area of the triangle. So we're going to use a very simple concept. Okay, uh, of course, these triangles here, we cannot just use half times length times breadth because huh? there's no 90 degrees. We have to use half AB sine C, no choice. So how does this work? So half AB sine C for the orange triangle, this one here. And obviously we want to go and try to find a way to get rid of the trigger ratio, which is the sine something lah. Okay, you don't purposely go and write sign of this angle here. And then you're going to get stuck because you do not have this angle. Uh, what do I mean by that? Okay, let's see. Eh? If I'm doing comparing these two triangles down here, so the red over the orange, you realize that this is a common angle. So if you let that be the sign of the don't know what, right? Uh, then it will be so much simpler. You make your life so much easier because the two signs will cancel. So I'll show you the working. So we're going to take TO or OT multiply by TQ times half times the sine of TOQ over half OU OS sine TOQ. So you get this. Yeah, there you go. Okay, you will get this. And if you were to do it properly, everything will cancel. So the sine TOQ will vanish because you are calculating the same thing. Okay, and if you were to work out all, if you realize all of the vectors, right, they are just all, uh, you can cancel like, literally everything. Okay, so all of the vectors will vanish and then the numbers, you're just left with 9 over 32. And that is your answer. So this question is a little bit on the difficult side. So if you cannot do it, it's okay. 
please go and practice. Remember the few ways that I've mentioned just now about vector triangles, same height, similar triangles. If Dai Dai cannot do anything, half AB sine C, it always works. Okay, the last one is part three. So the problem with part three is that if you cannot do part two, you cannot do part three because you need part three's answer, or you need part two's answer. So the question is asking you to figure out what is the area of OUS if the area of OTP is equal to 54. So the way to do this question is to first figure out or first notice uh, something very interesting that has happened. So we have OTQ and OTP. So I'm going to use this triangle here. Now, what's the reason why I want to purposely use this triangle here is because notice these two triangles here, they share the same height, okay? They share the same height and the height is going to be like some, oops, sorry, give me a second, here. Okay, we don't, I don't really care the height for now, okay? But this is a common height and we can solve for this common height, okay? So we can work it out. The area is going to be half times H times TQ, over half times h times tp. The half and the h's will cancel and you're left with this. Now, what is the reason why we need to use otp is because we want to use part two's answer and we are given otp. So we realize we get this. So five over eight and three over eight, you will be able to equate it to the area of the formula. Remember how I got this, huh? Yeah, let me rewrite again in case it's not clear half times the h times tq over half h tp. And no choice, this is the only way you can do it because then you can cancel your heights away and they are just common length, okay? So this is give you the area, the answer is 90 uh, for this part. And then because you want to find OUS and you have OTQ, yeah? your triangle OTQ and OUS. So you can write in the ratios, you can sub in the numbers, the answer is 320. A very common answer that I got was 360, uh, which is wrong because uh, people got the first part, the ratio wrong. So just be very careful, this is the answer. Okay, and we are done. So that's all of the questions that I want to tackle. Uh, I'm not going to touch 11 because uh, I'm running out of time. 11 is not as difficult as it seems. Okay, just read my answers. Uh, it is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you for those that stayed all the way. I hope that this was a useful session for you. For those that are listening online, I uh, hope that this is a, a informative session. I'm planning to do this uh, more, of course, in the future. So tomorrow morning at 9.30 will be the AMF version of this session. We'll be going through the AMF mock paper and also just to do a little bit of self-advertising. Uh, upcoming in the September holidays, I'm organizing a uh, what, crash course. So currently right now, uh, the chem and the bio crash courses are out already. The math ones are coming out soon. So if you are interested and you like my teaching, uh, it'll be an online session. I'll be going through the whole syllabus during these crash courses. Okay, So the details will be out very soon. Just wait out for it. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording here. Uh, then anyone has any questions, you can just ask me. Okay, goodbye to those that are online. Bye-bye.